tonight. Still on strike. Doctors in India deny non-emergency treatment while demanding justice for the victims of Kolkata's brutal rape and murder. Continued support. The caretaker government in Bangladesh, headed by Nobel laureate Yunus, pledges uninterrupted support for refugees amidst escalating tensions between minorities in the nation. Hot on the trail. The Democratic National Convention kicks off with both Harris and Trump campaigning in Pennsylvania before an official announcement of Harris as the Democratic nominee. And close call. A feline friend in need of desperate help is saved by the timely heroics of one expert kitten wrangler. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for taking the time to join us tonight on World News for our first bulletin for the week. Over the weekend, we saw quite a few new updates to key stories that we have been following throughout and we begin in our region in India. Hospitals and clinics across India turned away patients except for emergency cases as medical professionals went on strike for 24 hours in protest of the rape and murder of a trainee doctor in Kolkata. More than one million doctors were expected to join the strike, which paralysed medical services across the world's most populous nation. The government urged doctors to return to duties in the public interest. In a statement, it said a committee would be set up to improve protection for healthcare professionals. Patients queued up at hospitals, some unaware before they set out that strikes would interfere with their care. A 31-year-old trainee doctor was raped and murdered last week inside the medical college in Kolkata, where she worked. Her killing triggered nationwide protests and drew parallels to the notorious gang rape and murder of a 23-year-old student on a moving bus in New Delhi in 2012. Outside the RG Carr Medical College, where the crime took place, a heavy police presence was seen on Saturday while the hospital premises were deserted, according to the ANI news agency. Pakistan's government has disputed claims that it is building an internet firewall, causing painfully slow connections in the past few weeks. Instead, it blamed the widespread use of secure connections or VPNs for the crawling speeds. The statement comes after business groups warned that poor connectivity could lead to a mass exodus of its IT companies. Shutting down the internet to crush dissent is a familiar move in regulators' playbooks in Pakistan and other parts of Asia. Since the riots sparked by former Prime Minister Imran Khan last year, the government has blocked social media platforms and throttled connection speeds as the battle for public support spilled over from streets to the digital space. The microblogging platform X has been blocked since the February elections due to the national security concerns. Mr Khan's party supporters are big users of X and he's the most popular Pakistani on the platform but Minister of State for Information Technology Shah Sa Fatima said that the state was not behind the recent slowdown. She said her team has been working tirelessly with the internet service providers and telcos to resolve the issue. Ms Fatima said the large population had been using VPNs and this strained the network causing the internet to go slow. She said reports that the state was behind the slow connections were completely false. Bangladesh's Nobel laureate and new leader Muhammad Yunus said the caretaker government will maintain support both for its immense Rohingya refugee population and its vital garment trade. This was in his first major policy address. Bangladesh is home to around 1 million Rohingya refugees, most of whom fled neighbouring Myanmar in 2017 after a military crackdown. Setting out his caretaker government's priorities in front of diplomats and UN representatives, Muhammad Yunus pledged continued support for the million-plus Rohingya refugees sheltering in Bangladesh. We need sustained efforts of the international community for Rohingya humanitarian operations and their eventual repatriation to their homeland, Myanmar, with safety, dignity and full rights. 
Most of the country's Rohingya refugees fled neighbouring Myanmar in 2017 after a military crackdown in Rakhine state, which the UN said was carried out with genocidal intent. In recent months, violent attacks on communities of the Muslim ethnic minority have continued to trigger displacement as the country's military junta and the rebel Arakan army battle for control of key cities in the province. According to the representative of a panel of displaced Rohingya, this refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar has seen over 50,000 new arrivals in recent weeks, though the figure couldn't be independently verified. While access to water and sanitation in the camps has improved, overcrowding is putting further strain on resources. In June, Doctors Without Borders reported almost 20% of refugees in the camps have an active hepatitis C infection, though there's not enough treatment to go round. There are some delicate diplomacy moves at play as China and Vietnam inked 14 documents spanning cross-border railways to crocodile exports after Chinese President Xi Jinping met with Vietnam's new leader To Lam in Beijing. Lam's visit to Beijing, his first overseas trip since coming to power, signals a desire between the two communist neighbours to strengthen ties amid growing trade and investment despite occasional clashes over the boundaries in the South China. She said China has always regarded Vietnam as a priority in its neighbourhood diplomacy, underscoring establishing good working relations and a personal friendship with Lam. The two countries also signed documents on planning feasibility studies for standardised railway routes in what appears as a new step towards the upgrade of cross-border rail links after preliminary deals on the matter were signed in December during Xi's state visit to Hong Ukraine has destroyed a key bridge in Russia's Kursk region and struck a second one nearby less than two weeks into its stunning cross-border incursion, disrupting Russian supply routes and possibly signalling that its troops are planning to dig in. Emblazoned with a symbolic white triangle, which signifies this counter-offensive, Ukrainian tanks continued their advance into Russian territory, at times collecting road signs of the villages they had seized. Kyiv claims to occupy 82 localities in Russia's Kursk region, or 1,150 kilometers squared, including the town of Suja. But the question is, how long can it last? These satellite images show trenches dug by the Russian army in recent days that suggest it could be preparing for a new lasting front on its territory, as Ukraine claims to have set up a military office in the region and says it has plans to keep advancing. Russian residents who were evacuated in a hurry can't imagine leaving their region to the Ukrainian army for long. The Russian army is more powerful and for the time being seems to be prioritizing its advance into eastern Ukraine. But it may find it difficult to push the Ukrainians back onto their own territory. Folks have been at a standstill for two years, but this incursion has offered a glimpse of hope that Russia may be forced to negotiate. Amid Gaza's ceasefire negotiations that have been underway since last week, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Tel Aviv, marking his ninth trip to Israel since October of 2023. Blinken is set to meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu before heading to Egypt for ceasefire talks. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken landed in Tel Aviv Sunday, a visit aimed at intensifying diplomatic pressure to achieve a ceasefire in Gaza and end the bloodshed between Israel and Palestinian militant group Hamas. But just hours after he landed, Hamas raised doubts about the mission, accusing Israel of undermining his efforts. This is Blinken's ninth trip to the region since the war began in October. According to a senior State Department official, Blinken plans to meet with senior Israeli leaders, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, on Monday before continuing on to Egypt. Netanyahu addressed negotiations at the start of a cabinet meeting on Sunday, saying there are things we can be flexible on and there are things that we cannot be flexible on which we will insist on. We know how to distinguish between the two very well. His comments come as Israel is engaged in complex talks for the return of its hostages held in Gaza. A senior Biden administration official said the situation was now at an inflection point. The mediating countries, Qatar, the United States and Egypt, have so far failed to narrow enough differences to reach an agreement in months of on-off negotiations. Meanwhile, violence continued unabated in Gaza on Sunday, as Israeli strikes killed at least 21 people, according to Palestinian health authorities. 
Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, with just 79 days to go until Election Day, both U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump hit the campaign trail in the critical battleground state of Pennsylvania. Harris with his running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, ahead of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. A new candidate and a whole new race. Tonight, hours from the start of the DNC, new polls showing Vice President Kamala Harris transforming the 2024 election dynamic, eclipsing President Joe Biden in the race to defeat former President Donald Trump. The real and true measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you lift up. Yeah. That's what we see as strength. We know what strength looks like. That's what strength looks like. Anybody who's about beating down other people is a coward. Harris now with a six-point lead nationwide among likely voters in our new ABC News Washington Post poll. Harris invigorating young voters, now up by 20 points. Biden had only been up by two. And independent voters now favoring Harris by 11 points. Biden was down four points against Trump. Republican vice presidential nominee Senator J.D. Vance not taking those numbers to heart. Kamala Harris got a bit of a sugar high a couple of weeks ago. But what we've actually seen from our own internal data, Shannon, is that Kamala Harris has already leveled off. Vice President Harris and her running mate, Governor Tim Waltz, out together with their spouses for the first time, greeting supporters in must-win Pennsylvania. But on the top issues in this race, our poll shows the former president leading Harris by 10 points on immigration and nine points on the economy and inflation. Zeroing in this weekend on Harris's economic policies. She says she's going to lower the cost of food and housing starting on day one. But day one for Kamala was three and a half years ago. Republicans urging him to stay on message. His policies are good for America, and if you have a policy debate for president, he wins. Donald Trump, the, provo uh, the provocateur, the, uh, the showman, may not win this election. Opposition supporters have gathered across Venezuela to protest against Nicolas Maduro's disputed victory in last month's presidential election. Opposition leader Maria Cornia Machado joined thousands of protesters in the capital, Caracas, and urged them not to be afraid. They came to support the Venezuelan opposition. Opposition leader Maria Corina Machado was there to lead what was billed as a protest for the truth in the Venezuelan capital. She had come out of hiding to be present. Machado had called for mass gatherings in more than 300 cities in Venezuela and worldwide to pressure Maduro. The country's National Electoral Council said he won 52 percent of the vote in the 28th of July presidential ballot. The opposition says polling station level results show its candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, was the clear winner with 67% of the vote. Gonzalez is in hiding. He released a video to say the opposition would not surrender to the Maduro government. The Organization of American States is calling on the Venezuelan authorities to publish results expeditiously. Maduro has asked the Supreme Court, which is said to be loyal to him, to certify the election outcome. His previous re-election in 2018 was rejected by many countries, including the US, as well as countries in Europe and Latin America. Paris is going through yet another transformation as organizers take down setups used at various sports venues during the Olympics and put up new ones to accommodate the upcoming Paralympics. Notably, the beach volleyball stadium at the Eiffel Tower will be turned into a football field for blind athletes. The skateboarding in La Concorde has been replaced by machines and workers. It's time to reorganize, and the atmosphere is very different from the last few weeks when Olympic events were being held. But not everything will be dismantled. 
because it's here that the opening ceremony of the Paralympics will take place on the 28th of August, another much-awaited event in the heart of Paris. Several Olympic competition venues will be reused, including the Stade de France and Invalides. The beach volleyball stadium at the Eiffel Tower is being transformed to accommodate the blind football event. Organisers are banking on the venue to attract thousands of spectators to the matches. Another project is the Athletes' Village. These apartments, which were still occupied last week, had to be inspected. New beds and duvets have been brought in. The village has been designed to accommodate those with reduced mobility and will host 9,000 people. Priceless artworks housed in London's Somerset House, including paintings by Van Gogh and Monet, were unaffected by a fire that erupted at the historic building over the weekend. This is according to the gallery. Around 125 firefighters and 20 engines worked to tamp out the flames that ripped through the roof of the western wing, bringing the blaze at the more than 450-year-old site under control. Billowing smoke above the London skyline after a fire broke out in the roof of Somerset House, located next to the River Thames. It's a historic building, which is home to a series of major art collections. Tourists and passers-by were left astonished. Staff and visitors were immediately evacuated. Somerset House is renowned for its collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings, including this masterpiece by Manet and this famous self-portrait by Van Gogh. Fortunately, none were damaged as the fire broke out in a wing of the building that houses offices and does not contain works of art. Around 125 firefighters were called to bring the blaze under control. The cause of the fire is under investigation. Japan's national and Tokyo governments are seeking a $4.7 billion valuation for Tokyo Metro as they prepare to list the subway operator as early as October end. This is according to three sources in what would be the nation's biggest IPO in roughly six years. Tokyo Metro is the larger of the city's two subway operators and a major piece of its vast rail network. Its history stretches back over a century. It opened Japan's first subway line in 1927 between Wino and Asakusa, now a popular tourist spot. The national government and the city jointly own 100% of the operator. A source said they plan to arrange a meeting of brokerages within a week for a briefing on the IPO, and the governments expect to receive approval for the listing as soon as mid-September. With half the company to be sold, the valuation could raise nearly $2.4 billion, becoming the largest IPO in Japan since SoftBank listed its wireless unit in 2018. The central government plans to use the funds raised from selling its half to repay reconstruction bonds issued following the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. In response to a request for comment, Tokyo's government said the timing of the sale is under discussion and is not decided, while Tokyo Metro said it would not comment on the progress of the listing. Let's go in for a short commercial break now. More world news right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Tonight, we've got a story of heroics like no other to report to you. A kitten rescue that was on the brink of disaster. But thankfully, the furry feline was unharmed, thanks to the skillful methods of one very timely saviour. The poor thing was just very spooked, and very fairly so. Talk about a close call. John DeBacker from Long Island Cat Kitten Solution had a scary rescue on the Wanta State Parkway during morning traffic. He got a call about a kitten spotted along the center divider. When he got there, he didn't see her at first and looped around to look again. For safety and backup, John called New York State Police who halted traffic for him. As he got closer, the kitten tried to bolt and she was quick. John stuck with it and eventually captured the cute but feisty feline. The injured kitten was taken to Last Hope Animal Rescue and Rehabilitation. They named her Wanda, and when Wanda is all better, she will be put up for adoption. 
And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.